one season. And uh, there's still plenty to fight over, even if the top prizes are all decided. Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast. This is episode 244, where we will preview this year's Sao Paulo Grand Prix in Brazil. I'm your host, Tom Horrocks, and today in this Legends of Grid Talk special, we have the following host with us, Owain Medford. Hello. Tom Downey. Hello. And Ruby Price. Hello. And if you enjoyed this podcast, we would love it if you could leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll shout out everyone who leaves a comment on the next show. And if you leave us a review, you'll automatically be entered into our monthly prize draw to win some fabulous Grid Talk merchandise, which those of you watching on YouTube will notice I frequently use whenever I need a caffeine hit. And if you haven't done so already, why not subscribe to us on YouTube and click the bell to be notified whenever we go live. We're nearing 800 subscribers now, and uh, we have loads of content, including articles and shorts for you to get your teeth into as well. Give us a thumbs up, share and comment, because we love hearing from you. And any questions you do ask during our live stream, we will attempt to answer in our post show as well. So going ahead, looking ahead to this weekend's Brazilian Grand Prix, we should probably talk about the sprint, as this is the third, the third sprint race of the season. Uh, it's the final one of the year, and we now have two years of data, or certainly will do after this weekend. This is the sixth race. Max Verstappen has won three, Bottas has won two. And uh, so I'll ask the, the panel in general, what's our thoughts on the event as a whole and the expectations for this weekend, really? I'll start with you, Owen. There's a sprint race on. Um, <laughs> kind of forgot that they were going to be included. Um, no, I think I think that it's an interesting concept. I don't have it. I don't have any sort of sort of sort of negative feelings. I think the big, most positive thing for me is it's sort of a bit of a it, it sort of adds some spectacle in um, and and kind of builds the weekend a bit better. Um, I, I think sort of when it comes to the comp- uh, competitors, um, I don't think they're gonna. I don't think they like it. The idea of it whatsoever. It's extra risk, um, particularly with this one. And you know, let's be honest, Max Verstappen's probably going to win it. Um, you know, I think I think Mercedes might be a little bit hopeful. I think obviously their better race car might help might help them um, in some ways. But um, beyond that, I don't. I I I I think the teams probably see it as extra risk. Um, and I'm you know I'm not too much of a fan of the format. Um, but I don't hate it either. Yeah, I think I'm pretty much in the same vein. Tom, your, your thoughts on it? I think if a sprint race is going to work anywhere, it's going to work in Lagos, as of all the ones we've had this season. Because we had, I think the last one we had was Austria, which is like, th- like four months ago or something. Um, it's also the last time Leclerc won, lol. Um, but um, yeah, you know, obviously we saw last year's sprint race, just how good they can be. Um but I don't think it sort of fixes the overall issue, if you like, or not so much the issue, but it just, I, I don't think it adds something. All it really does is add the first in of a race where instead of pissing for tyres, you cross the line and you win, but you don't win a race, but you get points. But it's not a race, but you get points. But it's qualifying, but you get points. Do you see where I'm going with this? Um, and it's, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I mean, if, if it means that we get two racing starts, quote unquote, in Interlagos, I'm all for it because it's um, you, you know it, it is it is one of the best tracks on the calendar. Um, but uh, no, I just I, I just I, I just I'm not sold on sprint races, and F1 will never do reverse grids because let's be fair, it was because it was a somewhat reverse grid last year that that was why it went so well. Um, if you're a Hamilton fan, anyway. Um, but um. But yeah, just I, I think it's just gonna it's just gonna be a formality almost, um, especially given how dominant Max has become since sort of about Hungary time, where you know you could you could start him at the back and he'll finish the sprint race P one honestly. Yeah, I'm undecided on on a few elements elements of it. As as the races that have had sprints have tended to be quite good races, whether that's coincidence or or what, I'm I'm not entirely sure. Ruby, got anything to add on to that before we move on to the preview? Well, I think we're all sort of in agreement because everyone's kind of taken the points that I was thinking of. Um, Tom even just mentioning, you know, it was because Lewis Hamilton was starting right to the back in what was the last couple of races in the championship deciding season that gave us the excitement of last year's sprint. Um, like he said, if there is anywhere that it's going to work, it's into Lagos because, you know, it, it's one of those circuits with, you know, a lot of swoops and very long straights. That's the thing that, you know, we've seen with some of these sprint races. Like we saw it at Imola where it's difficult to overtake. 
why have a sprint there um other than the fact there's a very long straight um there just needs to be a bit more thought towards it because we're going to have six i think next season um it's just the format in theory should work but at the minute i don't think it does yeah i think certainly a bit more nuance to it a bit more um a bit more addition not so much kind of less crypto i'm fine with the kind of less crypto sponsorship and all that kind of stuff that they were plugging quite heavily last year but i think something adding something to it it can add to the show but i, I think that the purists are never going to be fully on board with it because it is just something so different to what to what formula one has has done in the past but what we are doing this weekend though we do have uh we do have a a the grand prix obviously with the with the uh with the sprint as well but the grand prix itself will is going to be the, the main focus of the weekend and the constructors champions red bull confirmed last time out they've got five previous wins here owain and uh, and max won in 2019 and that wasn't even a dominant car is there any stopping them this weekend um unless they decide that they just want to pack up early i don't i don't see anything other than max winning to be honest um it's i don't know that we're, we're sort of back in that era of that you sometimes get into where you where the regulations change and some team and, and a team just nails it um out the gate uh they've done you know i don't think it's it's a was it? it's over t- almost yeah it's over 200 points different between um ferrari and red bull that i think that tells you all you need to know that's not just strategy that is pacing the car and you know they've had a they're gonna have a good run of it probably i don't I, you know i think the, the way i see this for the grand prix at least is this is just another max verstappen it's another max verstappen win so it's, it's going to go to what is it um i don't remember it's 14 no sorry 15 15 it's... grand prix wins in a season I, I that's the way i see it <laughs> Yeah, it certainly does seem to be the be the favourite, and with the two sprint wins as well, it could end up being three sprint wins as well. So you could potentially end up seeing the chequered flag up to like eighteen, nineteen, twenty times even this season. So it's uh, it's been a, it has been a dominant season, but it's not been a walkover season. I think he's he's been a dominant season because he's just been been so good, Tom. And uh, and for, but Ferrari come here and they have the most wins. Uh, of any team with nine but haven't won here since 2017 the altitude really played hell with their turbo in mexico um do you think can you see similar problems here in brazil given that it is the second highest grand prix circuit or is that a bit of a bit of a red herring uh i mean fries can have issues regardless you know whether it's strategy reliability whether it's declared not being able to drive straight who knows um yeah i i mean They'll probably be battling with the Mercs for um, Mercedes might somewhat outdo them on quality pace, um, and then you know because you saw in Mexico obviously with a sort of very high altitude how well the Mercs did in, in qualifying, um, but then Ferrari will probably have the race pace a bit more than they're both they're both quite bad on their tyres in race trim those cars, um, we saw it a lot in Austin uh, when Leclerc's tyres just died off a cliff when he's trying to chase Max. Um, I don't see Ferrari doing much. Uh, I think it would take it would take something for them to win, such as you know, like, like Ruby mentioned, like the sort of twenty twenty one sprint where you know someone gets put to the back. You know, if Max gets disqualified for I don't know, like you know, you know, you know like spear fishing Ocon or something like I tried to do in twenty eighteen or whatever. So, um, you know, so it, it would take something like that, I think, for Ferrari to be on the front row. But I even think then Perez would mop up the win anyway because he did it in Singapore. He was going to do it in Spain before Red Bull swap positions. He did it in Monaco. He did it last year. So, you know, so so the Red Bull just everything is just working together. Um, you know, everything is sort of like perfectly in harmony. It was like Mercedes in 2017 when Bottas came in and was that dutiful number two and then the team was working perfectly with the car, with Hamilton, with everything. It's it's very similar to that. And and it's funny enough when I can't remember which one of you was, sorry, but whoever it was that mentioned that we sort of got I think it was you Owen where you said we've got into that sort of routine or that sort of rhythm where because the driver and the team are so at one, you just can't see anything else happening. And that's why given how inefficient and how Ferrari, Ferrari have been, if that makes sense. You know, they just imploded. That's why they're, they're, they're not going to win. They're not going to get anything. 
yeah, I completely agree with with your you know that the parallels there between between Red Bull at the moment and how Mercedes were um, back in sort of 2018, 2019 times or 2017, and yeah, just just a, just a, a a team that seems to just be doing everything right and it can't seem to do wrong for doing right. Um, but Mercedes this weekend, we've had pole Poland second place here is quite important. Twenty nine out of the thirty eight wins have come from. The, uh, the the front row of the grid, but uh, Lewis is the only driver Ruby who has won here from lower than eighth place, being last year starting from tenth and uh, uh, running the risk of disrespecting Red Bull and and being banned from media sessions. Could this be where Mercedes get that uh, that elusive first twenty twenty two win, or is that wishful thinking from us British bias people? <laughs> yeah, such a British bias. Um, I do think you know if everything lines up, you know which, you know, is kind of very wishful thinking anyway, but Lewis Hamilton has, loves this circuit. I think he's been given Brazil, like honorary Brazilian citizenship because of his relationship with this country, um, much to the displeasure of some people associated with um, the Red Bull group and Renault group. But um, yeah, last time out in Mexico, until the first round of pit stops, that Mercedes was within touching distance of Max Verstappen. It was a strategy call ultimately that I believe cost um, Mercedes a win in Mexico. I think that if they get a strategy correct, they could have a chance this weekend. I don't believe it would be George Russell. He just hasn't seemed to have had the measure of his teammate lately, with the exception of a qualifying session in Mexico. Um but I think if anyone can do it in Brazil, it's going to be Lewis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, he's he's obviously got pedigree here, winning a championship here in 2008 and won here multiple times. Um, but someone who has who did wrap up two championships here, uh, his only two back in 2005 and 2006, Fernando Alonso. Um, Alpine said a few weeks ago that they weren't, they were no longer looking at McLaren in the constructors' championship, and they were just looking ahead to Mercedes. Owen, and uh, but now, do you think maybe they might be casting an eye over their shoulder, especially given the result in Mexico? I mean, what was it almost three hundred points <laughs> between Alpine and uh, and Mercedes? Um, that might go down actually. Uh, I can see Mercedes. Um, well, trying not to finish second in the constructors and uh, over the next few races and, and trying to pick up as few points as possible in some ways. But um, no, Alpine, I think you have to absolutely look behind uh, look behind them because they're really not that far away. That You know, a Brazil, we've seen many, many times a Brazil first lap is, um, <clears throat> is, is a dangerous thing um, just because of the, you know, how good the circuit is for, for bringing the cars together at sort of the right places and, uh, and they've got to navigate two of them. Um, so I, I, you know, I think McLaren could very, very easily um, take that fourth spot in the constructors. So I, I you know, I, I think it's, I think it's one of those classic Renault statement, Alpine Renault statements of uh, amb- ambition ahead of of what they can actually sort of do. Um, you know, I, I, I honestly think they're they're kind of a bit delusional if they think that they have to, they don't have to worry about McLaren anymore. What did you think about Alonso's comments in the, in in the last week? Is he because he seems like I thought he was going to be like full tear down of Alpine in his last few races, and but but he seems to have been he seems to have been fighting the team cause. But certainly last week he seemed very very frustrated with with the Alpine. Um, I haven't seen his comments to be honest. Um... Well, no, it was more what what he was saying he, after the race and during the race. He was saying uh, he he was saying about uh, it's always car fourteen and and shaking his fist at the timing screens and stuff. Uh, I don't know. It's Fernando Alonso. Um, <laughs> I think a, he knows that there's a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of weight that comes with his voice. Um, <laughs> he's, he's used it he's used it time and time again this is not new um you know we're talking about a guy who's probably been at the center of almost every f1 scandal over the last 20 years so but he didn't have anything to do with any of them he was just an innocent bystander yeah, yeah. sometimes you think when the innocent bystander has been an innocent bystander uh, every single thing <laughs> Yeah, was it the is, so innocent? The, the, the phrase, if everyone you know is a rude word, then you're the rude word. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So mo- moving on to you, Tom. Then, so we've got uh, McLaren next in the in the, in the championship, seven points behind Alpine, as we we just touched on a mini renaissance from Ricardo last week, and uh, the ten year anniversary of Jensen Button's last win and McLaren's last win up until last season. Is it a case for optimism for McLaren or more kind of hope? 
last hope. Um, yeah, it's uh, what we saw from Danny Rick last week was akin to when someone is on their deathbed and they take that big final breath before they fi- before they move on. Um, that's what he did with his career, basically. That's that's my way of saying his career is dead. Um, it's uh, yeah, it was um, it, it it was good to see him, and I never thought that a ten second penalty or whatever he had would spark a driver to drive like a man possessed, but it did, and it was actually really nice to see. It's just far too little, too late, isn't it? You know, we we said time and time and time and time and time again this season and last season that he was the Achilles heel for McLaren. It's like if he'd have put more points in last year, they'd have probably beaten Ferrari to third in the, in the championship. If he'd have scored more points this year, um, they'd be ahead of Alpine in, in the championship. But they're stuck languishing where they are because he hasn't been good enough. I mean, London's been solid, you know, he's, he's had, uh, he had a podium in, I think it was Imola, and then possibly somewhere else. I think it might just be the one this No, season. just just Imola. It is just Imola, thank you. Um, and that was a bit, you know, bit, bit of luck involved in that. That scared the life out of me. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, he's a, uh, McLaren, they just need to focus on next year. Um, you know, two races left. I mean, put um, you, you put put Lando sort of in the fight with, with with the Alpines. Hopefully, the Alpines will blow up anyway. I mean, they did it in um, they did it in Mexico. You know, Alonso's car just completely just went pop coming down that main straight. They might do it again. I don't know. Um, Alonso will do something flamboyant anyway. That's what he always does. Um, so yeah, so McLaren needs to focus on that battle. Focus on next year. I don't know how much Oscar Piastri is involved. I don't know if he'll be in one of their FP1 sessions as a young driver. Um, I think it would possibly be a good idea, although I don't know if they can because he's contracted for next year. I don't know. I'm just spitballing and I'm waffling. Um, so, yeah, so TLDR, McLaren, Danny Rick, not good enough. Lando carrying the team as per. That's what's been for two years. Um, and, yeah, I think they're just looking forward to the future now. Yeah, unfortunately, Piastri is still locked into um, locked into Alpine, and they're not releasing him early for for McLaren. So he is still their development driver. So if he's going to get into an FP1 this year, it would actually be for Alpine, and um, it wouldn't be surprising if that Alpine happened to end up in the fence. Oh no, I happened to slip off. Oh dear. But moving on to Alfa Romeo, then Ruby, we got Valtteri Bottas leaving the uh, sorry le- leading the team uh, going this weekend. He does hold the, the fastest lap record for this track from 2018, and he is. Obviously, as we've already discussed, the the second greatest um, sprint race racer in history with two wins out of the five. Um, so can this can Alpha be a factor for points this weekend? Um, and can they push clear of Aston Martin? Or was it last week a bit of a blip? I'm not sure if points uh, plural is the um, condition, considering, you know, that one point that he got in Mexico was the first point position he's finished in since Canada. Um but, you know, like you say, he's gone well here previously. He was on the podium last time out in a significantly faster car. Um, yeah, he will probably outclass his teammate, um, who, you know, did have a relatively anonymous, but did make a few good moves last time out in Mexico. Um, but ultimately, you know, Alfa Romeo just need to continue this season finishing ahead of Aston Martin to secure P6 in the championship. I don't think, you know, they've got much interest. Well, they physically can't catch P5. Um, You know, I think it would require some photocopy documents or something or or other to have that happen. But yeah, Valtteri Bottas put some uh, drugs in his porridge and he might show up in P9 and get some points. (laughs) I think uh, mathematically, given there is a sprint race this weekend, there is still an outside, very, very slight chance that Alfa Romeo could catch McLaren, but it will require a 1-2 and a sprint race win with McLaren not scoring. So I think we can pretty much write that one off. But uh, moving on to, to Aston Martin then, no and a team that's really kind of snuck up on us, I think. Started the season badly, brought in a, a B-spec car, and then it was even worse. But they seem to have got things together, and that, that seems to have gone backwards a bit in Mexico with the car showing no pace at all. Um, how do you how do you see them going in this fight for for sixth place with, with Alfa Romeo? I mean, they're just looking there four is it four points they are behind Alfa Romeo? It's a very very tight fight. And to, if you'd have said to me um, about uh, uh, after the Spanish Grand Prix that Aston Martin would be in a fight for sixth place, I wouldn't have believed you. 
Yeah, neither. Um, it's you know, it's, it's quite surprising. They've like you say, they've kind of snuck up on us. Um, I don't really know how the car's going to perform really around around uh, into Logos. I don't. I, they're kind of in a weird position in that it's it, it's definitely possible that they could overtake Alfa Romeo by by the end of um, you know, obviously by the end of Sunday night, but um, that would obviously require quite a you know a great race from them uh and both finishing in the t- in the top 10 um but I, I think it's they're kind of in that sort of no man's land where they could they could do well they could do could do badly i think i don't luckily they don't really have to worry um about those behind them um i think that means they can probably be a bit be a bit more daring which might it might well be worth them you know really going out on a limb um you know, trying something, trying something different. They don't have to worry too much, I would say, about about those, about the Hass and uh, and the Alfatori behind them, um, and, and they've kind of got sort of nothing to lose but everything to gain. Um, but that, like I say, it is it is difficult with the pace of the car, uh, and assuming it, it sort of continues with what they had in uh, with what they had in Mexico, um, th- there's some difficulty. So there's definitely an opportunity for it, um, but I don't think it's going to be a, a cakewalk. No, no, I, I think probably the uh, the scenes of ten years ago of Sebastian Vettel winning a, winning his third world championship are a, a long, long way away. And but talk as well that um, over the last few days that Vettel didn't rule out a possible return in future, but it would have to be with a winning car, it seems. But uh, that car certainly will not be a Haas, Tom. Certainly in, in the in the uh, in the near future. But uh, last time Haas had a proper car here back in 2019, they did get two cars into Q3. So um, they are still yet to score points in Brazil, though. So can you see this ending this weekend, given that their um, their point last time out for Magnussen moved them ahead of, of Alfa Tori? Uh, can you see anything coming this, this weekend? And when do you think there'll be a decision over Mick Schumacher's future? Um, I mean, has have been so sort of hit and miss this season. I think I've said it before, they promised so much but delivered so little this season. Um, they just... Yeah, they're just they're, they're just you know, the start of the season was such a spark, and now it's just fizzled into nothingness. Um, it's been, it's been like a damp firework. Uh, I don't think they'll get points. I certainly don't think Mick will get points. <sighs> Maybe Kevin might sneak a point. You know, he might. You know, he, he's pretty aggressive on track. Um, so, you know, so he might he might sort of get his way up in the sprint, and then have a decent starting position on Sunday. Um, Maybe to my, you know, with a couple of DNS in front of them, but but given the sort of resurgence of Mercedes in the last half of this season, and then the, um, uh, you know, given that Alfa Romeo sort of maybe on a bit of an up, Aston Martin done a lot better, has to slump right to the back of the grid, unfortunately, give or take. As regards to Mick Schumacher, yeah, I've heard these rumours about the has second seat being announced on Thursday. Um, I don't think Mick will be staying. I think everything is pointing to Hulkenberg taking that seat. There's no smoke without fire, and this rings a bit of the whole Perez Red Bull thing in, in late 2020, when they're all saying, no, 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 it'll definitely be Albon and Perez won't be, and then next thing you know, one's out and the other one's gone. If you look at everything that's happened around it, Hulk has left his role at Aston as reserve driver. Stoffel van Dorn has gone there. That, op- that also opens up the reserve role for Danny Rick at Mercedes, which is another rumour. Um, and, you know, Hulk, I mean, I've got my own feelings on him. Um, but if you look at it from a Haas perspective, they're going to want someone solid, if unspectacular, in that seat for a year or two to just get the, get, get the car grounded. The only thing I'm concerned is, is um, will... Hulk take up Kevin's offer from Hungary in 2017. <laughs> I had a feeling that might be uh, that might be slipping in, and you would be the one who would deliver that. Um, I'll ask um, um, both of uh, our other two panelists the uh, their opinion on on the potential move of Nick Hulkenberg as well. Ruby, your thoughts on on Hulkenberg, yay or nay? Nay, purely just based on the fact that when he got into you know a good car last season for those substitute races didn't really deliver when he was on the grid this season at the start because Vettel was obviously missing still didn't deliver although that was still in the Aston Martin so you know he wasn't really going to deliver much but um I think 
you know, Mick has shown growth over the last two seasons in Formula One. Obviously, last season, you know, his main comparison was a driver who many people will say didn't even deserve to be on the grid based on several things, but also a very lackluster F2 campaign. Um, I think, you know, given another season, Mick could have been performing and out outclassing Kevin Magnussen. Um, who, you know, did slot very well back into that Haas team after a season of not actually being in Formula One. But ultimately, Nico Hulkenberg, he's still not going to get a podium, you know, and that that record is just going to continue. Um, if it turns out and it's an absolute disaster, will Haas put Kevin, will Haas put Mick Schumacher back in that seat? I don't think so. No, I think that bridge will be well and truly burned if they don't uh, take up the option for next season. Uh, Owen, anything to add on that? Um, just that I think that the the decision to to put, you know, as assuming that Mick, Mick does have to leave um, Haas and and they put Hulkenberg in, and that seems very much a business decision um, of minimising risk um, over a sporting decision. I think the ways um, that Formula One teams should really be looking forward rather than, you know, kind of looking to the side or in this case behind. They've already got an experienced driver in Kevin Magnussen if they wanted to want to do car development and get them. Um, uh, sorry, get them decent points results and things like that um, without sticking it in the hedge. Um, I think, you know, I, I, it's been proved. I've, I was often saying that Mick Schumacher will get better in his second season. It's just clearly not happened. Um, he's out of the Ferrari Driver Academy, um, so he hasn't got that fighting his corner as well. Um, or at least he's severed ties with it. Uh, you know, otherwise I'd say that it would be a good, it would almost be worth it to tr- try and jump to uh, to the Ferrari WEC program. Um, but you know, I don't, it'd probably be more successful in certain ways, and definitely have better tactics. But um, yeah, no, I, I feel that the Haas are sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place in that they they do need another. They probably need a different driver who's not Mick. Um, Hulkenberg is a really good option, um, but I don't think Hulkenberg is the is the long term option that they need um, to to shore up the success of the team. Um, unfortunately, I think they need someone like Piastri or somewhere else, someone else. You know, and you can't promote the fit of a. Um, I think Pietro Fittipaldi yet. Mm-hmm. Um, that he's the sort of person that they need to be banking on, um, and unfortunately, they just. And I, I think it's a decision that they've been forced into making, um, just by the slightly poor timing of everything else. And unfortunately, Mick is the um, is the is the casualty from that. Yeah, I think if you're looking at drivers that are eligible for a super license that aren't attached to another team or don't already have contracts elsewhere, then it's pretty much slim picking. So I can see why they're going with Hulkenberg if it's going to maintain that one-to-one sponsorship. But I just think, if why would you not just stick with the young guy who might have a better peak? You know, Hulkenberg's a known quantity, um, and he's known to be average. I think I said that in our Slack channel. Um, and I just don't see the the benefit of it. Like you say, less crash damage. That's the only benefit I can really see to it. But aside from Fittipaldi, there isn't really anyone else that, that has could bring in Giovinazzi, possible but you know we gave him a few laps in it and he put it in the in the barrier so i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure he would have been in contention had he performed well in that practice but yeah i I, for me i think i would rather stick with schumacher for another year but uh i I think the uh the business side of things will probably speak on that one but we'll head back to you um ruby for for alpha tori and by their own standards a terrible season really uh, both drivers close to race bands one driver clearly checked out uh, it's looking pretty glum um but will the fact that they're one point off Haas for eight spur them on or is that not really going to be in their uh, in their thinking well the thing with uh, pierre gasly and sprint races is probably going to come up at some point as well because you know all through last season had fantastic qualifying sessions sprint race comes along didn't really make it past the first lap in you know the points i think italy lost his front wing um it was a bit of a nightmare really but you know like you say uh pierre gasly is two points away from having a race ban based on his super license um so i don't imagine if i were pierre gasly i'd get those points you know get a clean run for when you go to alpine if you know i think we all appreciate that you know Gasly has checked out. He doesn't really care what happens to Alfatari this season, I don't think. Um, Yuki Tsunoda, um might end up, 
Yuki Spinodering uh, during the middle sector, you know, where it's a bit more tight and twisty. But yeah, I think it's going to take a pretty impressive performance to see them get at that point to put them level with Haas. And I don't know if that would actually put them ahead of Haas or not, because I can't remember who's had more higher finishes this season. But um, ultimately, it might give them a bit more air tunnel time to test for Red Bull, who are obviously going to be missing air time, air tunnel time next season. That's some really interesting points there. And, and yeah, the uh, I hadn't considered the the option there. You pick up two points this weekend and then you end up on zero points ready for Abu Dhabi, or ready for next season. That's that's a really interesting point. It's kind of akin to David Beckham in the World Cup when he got that second yellow card when he knew he'd be injured. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a 90s reference to anyone who remembers that one. Um, yeah, it's... that's And again, as well, the, the points about... I think with... With Haas and AlphaTauri, I seem to remember that Haas were relegated to ninth when they were on the same point as AlphaTauri. So I think AlphaTauri have the better results in that sense. So that's that's a possibility there. But like you say, the, the the wind tunnel thing, you know, there is no transfer of data between teams. We know that. Come on. That's just a crazy, crazy thought. Um, yeah. And seriously, though, yeah, uh, that's that's definitely a possibility and probably going to be in, in their thinking as well. Um, so well, the final team in the in the in the standings then, Owen Williams, Latifi's farewell tour reaches its penultimate stop all aboard the Latifi Love Bus. Just eight points to their name, which is um, eight points more than the last team from last year managed. But uh, no matter what happens this year, definitely will go down as a bit of a uh, bit of a disaster for Williams. No points here since 2017 with Felipe Massa. Can they salvage anything from this race and indeed this season? I don't think so. Um, it's Williams. I, uh, you know, the closest that they got. I mean, the car the car seemed better at the sort of uh, places with a, with a lot of straight line speed, or at least bleeding the downforce off the car. Basically, it seems to that seems to be um, where where it was happiest. Um, I'm not sure that's sort of that it, it's a mix obviously at Interlagos it's quite high altitude um so you put the downforce on the car but on the other hand it's yeah it's it, it, it it's a, it's a it's a tricky one so I don't think they I don't think they're going to have car performance um to, to rely on I they, for me there's kind of no point with Williams being there they're um they just they really are an also run um I I don't know what they can do um beyond i guess test bits for next year test test anything you know just have something interesting <laughs> you know try, try, try something different and like other than that it's it, it for me for them it's it's a test session um you know i i hope that they've been treating the ones the races prior to this as a test session but i don't there's no way that they can get you know the extra money that comes with a with, with a spot uh with with a ninth place in the constructors and um, you know, all, all they're going to get is, you know, the the maximum, I think, what was it maximum budget cap, maximum um, parts that they can test in, uh, in CFD and wind tunnel, and that's it. Yeah, it was 100, 115% wind tunnel time of uh, of the seventh place team, which means, what, 30, uh, like 40% more wind tunnel time than Red Bull, I think it works out as. And they kind of race seventh place as the, uh, as, as the marker, and then they, they take it from there. But obviously, Red Bull only having 63% because they were so hard done by and uh, and uh definitely formula one should apologize to them um but uh yeah I, i'll definitely gonna gonna bow down to your knowledge on that one owen as i do remember the pre-season uh predictions we were making and and you uh yourself were saying that williams were going to be the bottom team by quite some way and i said no they'll be sixth or better so yeah you you definitely win on that prediction so uh, i don't know what i was thinking to be honest i don't know what i was thinking <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. This this is the only time that one of my bets has ever paid off. Yeah, I, I can see when I mentioned pre-season predictions, you were thinking, oh God, what's you going to drag up? But uh, no, you were absolutely spot on. So so well done on that. So um, I'll let everyone uh, just plug your social handles and other projects that you want to. If you want to follow me, I'm at Tom Horrocks F1 on Twitter. Uh, and I also do the Monkey Seat podcast. Owen, where can people find more from you? If you really want to hear one of my thoughts uh, on my completely unverified Twitter account, um, you know, I think you have to go to at Owen Medford. I think that's the one I'm, um, I'm using for actual work. Can you not afford the £8 a month yet? Um, it's not can't. It's just I will never want to afford that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tom, where can people find out more from you? Um, nowhere, basically. Um <laughs> 
uh, from Grid Talk, obviously. Uh, yeah, so well, well, yeah, so I'm part of Grid Talk. You know, like I said, I'm 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 co-host and definitely the world's second co-host. Um, <laughs> a, 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 a long, alongside you lot. Um, I mean, I'll let you do the plug about Grid Talk itself. But yeah, that's it. I'm, I I I don't really have much social media. I've got LinkedIn. Um, that's yeah, that's 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 about it. Um, I'd rather poke out my eyes and use Twitter, and I'm far too old and unattractive for TikTok. So, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's sort of like, there's your answer. Okay, and uh, Ruby, we'll move on to you. Yeah, if anyone wants to find me uh, on the socials for some reason, it is at Rubes, R-U-U-B-E-Z. If you're looking on Instagram, put a 001. But I did manage to get the at Rubes handle on YouTube, so I was quite happy with that. Um, now I just need to actually remember to post to my YouTube channel again. Amazing. And thank you as, as well for uh, for reminding me that I haven't yet done predictions for this show. So uh, let, let's, let's jump onto that now then. So if we look for, um, are we wanting to predict the sprint or are we just going to ignore that? Um, I think we'll probably ignore the sprint. That's going to be effectively pole position, isn't it? So um, pole, uh, what is it we normally predict? Is it pole and win? Or was it a podium? I can't remember. It's been so long since I've done a preview. Poland, I can't actually remember. Poland podium. Okay, Poland podium then. We'll start with you, Owen. Thank you. And bold. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with, uh, yeah, it's going to be a, it, I, I can't see it being anything other than Max Verstappen and, and Checo Perez, um, one and two respectively. Um, you know what? I'm going to go with Charles Leclerc in third place. Okay, um, and uh, do you have a bold prediction for us? We'll throw that in as well. Uh, Mercedes team order it so that they don't have to, uh, so that they don't come ahead of Ferrari in the constructors. <laughs> okay, Tom, yourself. Uh, well, I mean, Paul is going to be Max. It, 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 I, I know I sound like a fanboy, but if you look at how he's going at the minute, it's hard to look at anybody else. Maybe Sainz or Leclerc over one lap. So if you're talking about the winner of the sprint, it's going to be Max, because it's basically a race. Um, but in terms of the actual race on Sunday, the feature race, if you like, um, I would say uh, Max is probably going to walk it. Um, behind him, I'm going to say Sainz P2 and Hamilton P3. Okay, and a bold prediction? Um Both has in the points. Ooh. Going back on everything I said earlier. Yeah, well, that's bold for a reason. And Ruby? Uh, Pole, very obviously, Fernando Alon. No, um, it's <laughs> going to be Max. It's going to be Max. Um, you know, I think we've established that's just almost guaranteed at this point. Um, however, I'm going to stake a lot on something different, please. Um, and I'll say uh, Checo to win. I think the Red Bull's probably too good a car for it to be anyone else, even if Max, you know, gets taken out in the race. Touch wood. Um, and then finish off the podium with um, Lewis and George, um, really. My bold prediction being... Um, I need to come up with a bold prediction very quickly. Um, bold prediction... Has don't announce Nico Hulkenberg as Mick Schumacher's replacement on Thursday, oh, specifically nice. Thursday. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think uh, f for myself, I think the uh, I think the race win will probably go to Max Verstappen. Um, I I'm gonna go with a Carlos Sainz pole, but uh, well, I say pole. He's gonna start the race from from the pole position, but I th I think that Lewis Hamilton's uh, my bold prediction will be Lewis Hamilton actually getting the official, well, the, the, the qualifying, fastest in qualifying award, whatever it's called now. But then, as usual, in the sprint, he will go backwards. Uh, the remaining podium then uh, will be will be Perez and Sainz. That's going to be my prediction. And Tom, I understand you want to just throw in a last bold prediction. Yeah, I was thinking about it. I was thinking, you know, double house points. That's not bold. That's just ludicrous. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my bold prediction to George Russell has an accident, doesn't say crikey, and then actually takes accountability for it. <laughs> okay, moving swiftly on from that. Uh... <laughs> 
So if you want to hear more from the Grid Talk podcast, we do have a huge back catalogue of shows now, as I said earlier, 244 odd. Um, so uh, you can go back and listen to any of them. And we also have, uh, as well as race shows, we do have some interviews and various other specials as well. Uh, the audio version does go up slightly, slightly after our live YouTube version, which is available on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, Omni Studio and Pocket Cast, and probably a few others as well if you dig deep enough. Uh, we also run a Patreon so if you want to help us continue to do what we do then please consider donating to us as everything does go back into the show to improve the experience. We will be back this weekend to review the Sao Paulo Grand Prix qualifying on Saturday so we will see you then. Goodbye. <laughs>